Так, прошу внимания. May I have your attention, Mr. Rar? Mr. Rar? I'm going to send a police officer to you. And that's uh, Jan Buzik's fault. So, Mr. Buzik, please uh, resume your seat. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let's start the last session of our two-day event. Um, so it's been a torture, and I only have to tolerate you for one more hour. So let's start the discussion. So. We talked about the greater Middle East, that includes the South Caucasus area and the Middle East itself. And yesterday, we discussed for the whole day the most uh, urgent problems of today, the war of the West against Russia, how to stop the anti-Russian sanctions, they are anti-legal, if I could use that word. And uh, we listen to a lot of uh, interesting ideas and thoughts and proposals regarding that. So let's try to hold a discussion focusing on those matters that are on your heart, on your mind, as the Slovaks say. A direct translation. I have a lot of important questions on my mind. That includes uh, the situation in the Caucasus in Armenia. The situation in Armenia, let's be blunt, is catastrophic. In 2020, Armenia lost a war to Azerbaijan as a result of uh, actions of its prime minister who sold both Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh area. Isn't that a fact? In 2004 and 2005, I sent to Armenia a lot of weapons from Slovakia, 10 plane loads of uh, Su-25, and a lot of other equipment that became uh, irrelevant after like a joint uh, NATO. So it had to be destroyed at military equipment, but I made an agreement, give it to Armenia instead of destroying it. And you could use the money. An SU-25 plane was worth $25, $5,000, not millions, but thousands. And none of that was used during the war. So, uh, Armenia got the first Iskander. It was not the, the Russian arm, army that got the Iskander, but the Iskanders were not used. A couple of Iskanders would be enough to stop that war if they were put to use. Then Armenia bought uh, uh, S-300 and Baku fired on all S-300 and not a single time hit the uh, mock-up it hit the s300 so they got the map it was sold to them and there were lots of mines when i was there during those years with the deputy minister yuri Khachaturov, colonel general and i told him how is karabakh doing in terms of uh, having enough uh, equipment and supplies. He said it would be catastrophic for them to go through the minefields. It would be catastrophic. And apparently they had been given, the Azerbaijani had been given the maps of the minefields and so on and so forth. 
That's yeah. what happens when you have a traitor in the government. As Mr. Zatulin said yesterday, a traitor. And we didn't deserve to lose the war. And the onslaught continues. And everything that Mr. Alif is asking for is given to it by Armenia. What we are waiting for now is for all opposition forces that are against Pashinyan could get to a level where we can replace him. And he's backed by the West very seriously. He's, he's, he's getting guests from um, America. And he gets visitors such as Victoria Nuland and the likes of her and they're doing uh, dirty deeds there in Armenia and their position cannot get to the end and that's curious and I'm saying this for the liberal press of Slovakia listen to this listen to this liberals Moscow doesn't help us Russia is saying we are not going to interfere in the domestic affairs of our neighbors. Did you hear that? I'm doing everything that they would interfere. And they're saying, no. What are you going? To, we're going to welcome what you're going to do. That's what they're saying. So, so all of this talk and chit chat that Russia is an aggressor, that it immediately interferes in the affairs of others. Russia respects Azerbaijan's domestic policies and affairs and Armenia as well. We are strategic partners with Russia. We have a 30 year agreement, a very strong one with Russia, where it is supposed to help Armenia if there is aggression from a neighbor. And they keep that, but they're saying, while your relations are okay, we are not going to interfere with your affairs in Armenia. So unfortunately, this uh, situation inside Armenia continues. 10 million Armenians uh, live in the world and 7 million are abroad. 7.5. I don't even think that 3 million live in Armenia, although officially that's the number. That's the population. And uh, the whole Armenian diaspora is backing Armenia which is against this terrible leadership of the country. Good for nothing. People had, that had done nothing in their lives. Pashinyan is a journalist who didn't finish the university, he didn't graduate, he's a journalist, a loser. And I don't even want to talk about the others. And I give the floor to uh, His Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. What I would like to say, a few things as a methodological background for this symposium. For many years, at least for 10 or even more years, Bratislava has been having a conference known as GLOBSEC, or otherwise Global Security. And that was a conference that was very much in the spirit of uh, political correctness, PC. And the things that were said at the conference were all PC. Uh, there were a lot of interesting facts that transpired during the conference, because this conference is organized every year prepared calls across many countries in Europe, even on uh, foreign policy issues. And it emerged that Slovakia and Bulgaria are relatively or very pro-Russian. 
This year, the new government, the government of FITSO, said that it is not going to budget this conference, to provide money to the conference. And now the conference is gone from Bratislava. It went to Prague. Right. The Czech government is probably providing them with the funding. That's okay. And uh, you can see from this symposium that this symposium is quantitatively cannot compete with Globsec because Globsec was a large scale international conference. However, our symposium is, is free and freer than Globsec because here you can talk freely and look at things freely look at what's going on in the world so that the global majority can be said that it is uh, stronger much stronger so that the west can no longer dictate its will to the rest of the world that's how much stronger that had gotten And uh, our symposium wants to continue being like that, that free in the future. So we are going to invite here people who speak their mind. And you could argue with that, you can agree with that, that's up to you. And that's how you can picture what is the real state of the world at this juncture. And we're really thankful to all of you, because many of you have problems in your own countries, and you are able to talk about what you think about that. What you believe uh, is right. What you believe uh, is the truth. And we want you to be able to do here, to say that here. We are very thankful to you for coming here and for saying this here. And that allows us to build a proper picture of the world, what's going on from your country's perspective and based on your country's experience, based on what's going on in your country, so that we could continue. And uh, we would uh, thank uh, you for helping us with organizing such kinds of symposia in the future, so that you and people like you could come to Bratislava to ensure that uh, Bratislava's standing uh, and image would not be built by the conferences like Globsec, political correctness and, uh, and by the political, so that it is politically true and uh, uh, honest. Thank you very much for saying that. Uh, you're absolutely right, Globsec was uh, one-sided and in, in a way catastrophic, uh, definitely not Slovakian event. They uh, used the uh, power of the dollar very uh, well, very artfully, but now we are pro promoting anti globsec Mr. Rar, or did you want to say a few words? Yes, yes, of course. But please use the microphone and ensure it is unmuted. Um, I would like to avail of the opportunity that we have a, a number of distinctive experts united around the table and, and online to just get back to the idea of the security architecture, which has been discussed here uh, today and yesterday. Um, 
And I mean, we identified a number of reasons that contributed to the conflict in Ukraine. The, the fact that the European space is divided into two military alliances, um, the deconstruction of the existing security architecture, um, and uh, the end of the Pax Americana and the, the uh, establishment of a new international order. <clears throat> now, when we look at the, uh, the, the, the conflict in Ukraine, then there have been a number of initiatives that have been developed to um, end the conflict and to, to stabilize the security situation in Ukraine. And, and over the time, the, the focus of these initiatives has widened. I mean, in, in 2015, in February, Minsk II was a very regional focus. I mean, uh, it said in the one-page uh, agreement that there should be a special status for certain regions in eastern Ukraine. Um, now, when we look at December 2021, the Russian proposals um, to NATO and the Americans, I mean, they very much based themselves on the existing situation in Europe. Right? They said, okay, NATO Eastern expansion has taken place, um, but we don't want any further expansion of NATO. Uh, we, we certainly don't want to see Ukraine and Georgia included into NATO. Um, a few months later, um, during the discussions between the Ukrainians and Russians in Istanbul, um, I mean, they also based themselves on the existing structures. Uh, they said, okay, Ukraine should not become a member of NATO. Um, now, in 2023, when the Chinese made their proposals, I mean, they widened the focus uh, again. They said, uh, as one of their points, uh, Europe needs a kind of new sustainable security architecture, um, which goes much beyond, I mean, what has been discussed before. Um, and now, more recently, um, we had uh, the speeches by Russian President Vladimir Putin um, to the Federal Assembly and a week ago to the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs of Russia. Um, and there he outlined the idea of an Eurasian security architecture. Um, so he said he had discussed it with the Chinese. It very much integrates with the Chinese idea of a global security initiative. Um, and he also said it's open to all Eurasian countries, uh, including. European Union and NATO members. Um, and so I just wondered, I mean, uh, as, as some of you will certainly have followed, I mean, this debate, I mean, what is the current state of this debate in Russia and in China? And I mean, what is the state of the debate here on, on our side of the divided European space? Uh, because when we go back to the 1990s, I mean, we had a debate of a common European house with Russia. Uh, there was somehow the idea of integrating Russia into like our system. Um, there was also the idea to say, okay, if the Warsaw Pact doesn't exist anymore, we maybe don't need NATO anymore, or at least it shouldn't be the main pillar of European security. We can maybe develop the OSCE further. And now the debate is a very different one. Uh, now it's a Chinese, Russian, Belarusian initiative that somehow wants to integrate Central and, and Western Europe. Um, and I mean, a few weeks ago, we organized, uh, our Eurasian society organized an event in Berlin and we discussed the situation in Ukraine. Um, and one of the ideas was the one which Alexander Glebovich uh, he, he introduced yesterday to say, well, maybe we need a new Helsinki process in, in Europe, yeah? because we have the experience, the devastating experience of two world wars, but we also have the experience of how to get away from the brink of war. I mean, how to get together to discuss problems in Europe and to find solutions. Um, and uh, I mean, may maybe it's, I mean, the right moment now, I mean, it's very late already, but still the right moment to, to get together again in Europe to discuss the problems which we have. Um, maybe, I mean, Bratislava or Budapest would be good places to meet. Russians might be able to come here. I mean, uh, people from all over Europe can participate. And um, given the fact that the uh, Helsinki Accord was concluded in 1975, I mean, next year is the 50th anniversary. That would also be a symbolic somehow date to say, okay, by that time, we somehow want to have a new process on this. Um, but in the, in the absence of such an initiative here in Europe, um, to put it in the world of uh, Mikhail Le Leonidovich, I mean, um, are we still sitting at the table when the new security architecture is being discussed? Or are we somehow... Well, losing the, the role of a subject and a more merely becoming an object that is being like integrated into a new structure. Thank you very much. 
I'm absolutely agree with you. It's absolutely true what you tell us now. I would like to ask the other colleagues of mine, would anybody else uh, to add something to that? Irina, Alexander Ra, you're welcome. Just, I think we need uh, to thank the organizers for such a titanic labor uh, to bring together uh, so many experts and uh, to uh, bring together uh, so many exciting thoughts and ideas. And of course, to express a wish that the Bratislavan a peace process should keep developing and expanding so that we shouldn't be paying so much attention at the liberal press who would be standing in the way. But just uh, in line with what West and Russia really want now, uh, judging by Putin's uh, considerations to uh, start this uh, process, presenting this idea. In February, we didn't have this prospect. Now, after what happened over the past few weeks, I think uh, this opportunity has appeared. So it's important that this process uh, should keep going. And I uh, would uh, support uh, what my colleague said. We need to learn now as researchers, as scholars, as politologists, to start thinking about what kind of Europe we would like to live after the Ukrainian uh, conflict is finished. Not only the Ukrainian conflict, but also conflicts in the Gaza Strip and anywhere, anywhere else. So what kind of Europe is it going to be? Nobody uh, seems to be discussing uh, that. And I think that a research ve venue just like ours uh, should be able uh, to make the relevant conclusions, not in the media. Uh, so while everybody is still fighting, we have to think what will happen to Europe? Will Do we want Europe uh, to be split again? Uh, I don't think so. But maybe uh, the process has gained so much momentum uh, that we won't be able to stop it. Uh, the forces will be about uh, on parity, uh, on about parity and uh, what uh, couldn't uh, have been uh, imagined three years ago, uh, the vast uh, remilitarization of uh, Bundeswehr, uh, in preparation for war, uh, that has been openly stated uh, by the German Minister of Defense. And just listen to what Macron is saying. This will be a way for us tearing Europe apart again. Uh, one needs to stop somewhere, uh, regardless of any arguments they're putting on the table. So they're to blame or these people are to blame. But how to stop the situation? I don't uh, have uh, any idea how it can be done. But sooner or later, I mean, every crisis uh, comes to an end with some trade-off. But how, what these compromises are going to be going to look like? I'm... Uh, very much curious about these questions and I would very much like us uh, to you know draft some joint publication discuss this not just discuss it like here with the Russian co uh, colleagues so in Europe we do you don't understand anything and in Russia we have our own problem no no because of course this is a way to talk again but uh, this is not the best way for a compromise. We just need to come out of this catastrophic situation. So uh, it's like five minutes to 12, if 12 is the time of war. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. R. And uh, who shall I give the photo? Yeah, my plan is like this. Keep working uh, with Premier Fitzo, with uh, President Pellegrini, our partners uh, will be helping us in Bushpa and others. And finally, to uh, 
achieve that either in September we could call President Putin plus uh, some uh, other major players, and this is your idea, Alexander, we could organize a meeting between uh, Putin and Trump. That will help Trump a lot to win his election, because if they are able uh, to reach an agreement that they uh, will uh, reach a peaceful agreement around Ukraine promptly, that would be a real gift to the 8 billion strong world. And then uh, we'll come back uh, to these issues. Mr. Kamel, you're welcome. Uh, I just have a comment uh, to what Alexander Ra said. This question of what's going to happen with Europe and how it can come out of this crisis, the answer is quite simple. Become realists. Stop believing in fairy tales uh, in Russia. Do you think we, we're talking about Europe specifically? No, no, no. I mean this. European Union. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to uh, tear it apart. The European Union, EU, once the EU stops believing in fairy tales, uh, myths that uh, they thought of themselves or somebody imposed on them, when they stop looking at the world without pink uh, spectacles, uh, everything will become right. They took it Fitzo as an example. They, the people just took off the pink eyeglasses and then uh, we'll be able to discuss Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok once again. So in this relation, we agree uh, with you, Alexander. Europe is uh, just like uh, you say, from Lisbon uh, to uh, Vladivostok. Uh, Russian culture is one uh, of the pillars of European culture. And I uh, uh, said yesterday uh, that uh, you will find a problem uh, trying to uh, find uh, a democratic country like Russia in Europe. They're blaming Russia on being a dictatorship, but uh, look at yourself, uh, how you work with people calling yourself Democrats. So in this respect, I absolutely agree uh, with uh, Mr. Kamel. Uh, take off the pink glasses. Uh, that's a wide saying. Please take off the pink glasses. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, from uh, the EU, just listen to what Vice, uh, what President Václav Klaus has been telling you for seven or eight years ago. This is the end of the EU and the start of something absolutely new. Mr. Buzek, over to you. I just wanted to say I grew up I grew up uh, in a in the socialist time and uh, the socialist time uh, what uh, made it different uh, from today that was the time when we all had uh, some uh, you know, guiding stars in life. Today, we don't have them at all. We live in a society where uh, the Constitution bans ideology. And I, what I can say is that a human, like a homo sapiens, a supposedly intelligent, and intelligentsia, intelligence is based uh, on the ability uh, to build plans. You're talking about Europe, but Europe is about Europeans, and the Europeans don't have their own plan, none whatsoever, or at least, I mean, it's being kept secret from me. So, unless... Unless... Uh, we uh, like the development in Slovakia. So we may like uh, the uh, uh, development of things in Slovakia, at least in terms of uh, its uh, unbiased 
attitude towards Russia, but I, I haven't seen any plan for Slovakia either. Uh, so, regarding the human intelligence, no, you should use the, I'm sorry, you use the word intelligentsia, but say in Russian you use the word in, in intellect or intelligence. Anyway, yes, I'm talking about intelligence. So that this intelligence uh, should multiply, uh, these intelli intelligences uh, should be brought together. Uh, we need a society that is capable of developing this intelligence and what we see at least i personally see all the more so that uh, as a publisher what i see in today's russia is uh, you know major uh, figures uh, one person the historian another uh, is a healer yet a third one is an orthodox a uh, priest, all of them are taking this society a bit upwards, each uh, doing their own part. I don't see such figures in Europe, at least in Czechia. What I see is a way upwards only through the definition of uh, some national idea. Thank you. I also fully agree with you. I remember uh, a joke. So a person comes, uh, goes uh, to Rabbi and uh, scolding his a neighbor, and then the neighbor comes to the Rabbi, and the Rabbi says, uh, "I agree with you as well." And so the person standing next to the Rabbi says, "You said you agree with this neighbor and that neighbor. I agree. That can't be. Uh, it can't happen." And I fully agree with you, the Rabbi says. So it's just like what I feel right now. I agree with all of you. I am trying to look uh, for uh, anyone here with whom I could disagree, but I don't find. So maybe uh, we, have, uh, we haven't given you uh, the floor. Yesterday, uh, we had a chairman of the anti-fascist organization of Slovakia uh, with whom uh, the Vienna Club uh, has a plans to work and his vice president of the anti-fascist organization, the secretary. Okay, will you introduce yourself? Uh, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. I am the secretary of uh, anti-fascist fighters across Slovakia. Thank you very much. Uh, we work together and uh, we'll keep work, uh, helping each other and we'll be supporting the uh, September meeting. Uh, we'll be uh, talking uh, to the deputy heads, uh, deputy chairman of uh, the parliament, Mr. Blaha. He's a member of our organization. We'll be talking to the deputy chairman of the government of Slovakia. So I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Thank you, Juan again. And I'm speaking on behalf uh, of uh, our chairman who attended yesterday. Uh, we are going to celebrate 80 years of the uh, Slovakia national uh, uprising. Thank you very much. Uh, some time ago, anti-fascist organizations and things like that looked uh, like a second rate something for all of us. But in the past few years, the fascism has gained so much ground. Uh, we couldn't have believed that. And now uh, we feel a great need for such anti-fascist organizations. Yes, perhaps uh, together we will fight uh, so that in Ukraine and in other regions of Europe. Uh, over to you. You know, uh, this uh, latest uh, epoch where we are today and which is coming to an end, all uh, the concepts are blurred. So we're saying Nazism, fascism, but largely speaking, we're referring to all anti-human practices, all those practices uh, that destroy the uh, personality of a human being uh, and uh, identity of peoples and also the civil freedoms. 
And now that I've got the microphone, we indeed are looking for ways. I also uh, entitled my presentation as a choice of, as a search for a way, even though I was uh, thinking about the Caucasus. Let's not uh, run too far away uh, from our predecessors. We have several levels uh, to uh, turn the problem uh, into a task. Uh, the strategic level, tactical level, and operational level. It looks uh, like, uh, in some strange way, uh, we need to discuss, we have to discuss uh, the operational and strategic levels, but the tactical part uh, is uh, being omitted. And I'm not, uh, don't have clear understanding how to act in these conditions. Considering that the inertia of the old order of things have, has created conditions where it is very difficult uh, to uh, solve uh, problems at the operational and strategic level. It's uh, quite uh, an interesting situation, agree with me, because, on the, uh, well, in general, we can discuss strategy. Mr. Buzik said, yes, there are. The public as well, intellectuals who would want to discuss that, uh, not in terms of who's good or who's bad, it's not really serious anymore, but what to do next and what to rely on and what kind of system can uh, provide uh, uh, security. And by the way, I'd like to comment that uh, with regard to the EU country, uh, food security is not the last question that should be discussed. Considering, for instance, uh, that uh, Germany uh, cannot provide itself uh, with uh, food. And if, for some reason, the communications uh, can or can uh, be disrupted, I don't even want to, con to, to, uh, to continue. You know, these are relevant operational questions that needs to be discussed. And uh, maybe uh, some of them uh, will not even evoke uh, some uh, overtly a negative response, reaction. So to be absolutely frank, I believe uh, that today the most important thing uh, is uh, to uh, act in the right way at this operational level. Thank you. I, I thought that you were passing me an envelope with money and I was wondering how you got to me. Uh, Mr. Chair, Yes. Isabel Cassel from Germany. Is she online? Yes. I was just asking how I can take part in the discussions from online. Yes. Um, I was just asking how I can take part in the Absolutely, of course. Okay. I hope you can hear me. Um, I also wanted to pose some questions and maybe try to wrap up a, a bit what was said. So, um, like I said, I, I feel as a European and I'm kind of patriotic in that sense. And I think we all are, um, but not concerned with the EU, but as the continent Europe. So I think our interest as Europeans can only be to live in prosperity and peace amongst each other and our neighbors, including Russia. So it can, of course, never be in our interest to have another big war on our continent. So how could we let ourselves fall so much under US interests? And I think we really have to speak about interests. Now here, we also have to talk about the main instrument for that, which is NATO, which might be a factor and even a player for itself, I think. NATO has been transformed into an offensive alliance since the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, uh, as it has been obsolete ever since in its original sense and should have been dissolved as I think as well but it is a power instrument which would do anything for its preservation. Um, so NATO has tried to give itself the appearance of continued legitimacy by intervening in escalating wars around the world in violation of international law, law and thereby weakening this, weakening international law. In the process, it has become the greatest threat to our security in Europe and worldwide, in, in my eyes. Even Stoltenberg has now publicly admitted that um, we are at war because NATO's eastward expansion and thus NATO troops on the Russian border. 
In the fall 2021, Russian, uh, Russia's proposal to negotiate a treaty on this issue was ignored or rejected. Instead, Ukraine continued to be armed and rearmed, as we all know. Also, leading US politicians have said that NATO's eastward expansion is a ticking time bomb. Now, this exploded on February 24, 2022. As wrong and condemnable as the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, NATO provoked it. Even concerning the NATO Charta itself, Ukraine can never be a member because the entry requirements are a functional democracy and market economy, an unresolved problems with ethnic minorities, no border disputes or unresolved territorial relations or regional differences. Now, even Biden pretty much ruled out a NATO membership of Ukraine. So why must this war still go on? Getting more and more escalated with more and further reaching weapons with the threat of a nuclear Armageddon. And what can we do to stop this? The Ukrainians themselves, I think, like the population, the soldiers, the generals can stop it. We can stop providing the armed support for the war and we can oppose NATO troops and exercises in our own countries. I would, it would also help if the countries with sensible governments like Slovenia would join, uh, the Slovakia, I'm sorry, would join the Nuclear Weapons Treaty and thereby inspire other countries to help ban these illegal weapons of mass destruction from Europe. And the intelligent response to the Russian stationing plants in Belarus would be the offer to end nuclear sharing and withdraw the US nuclear bombs from Europe in return for Russia renouncing the stationing of nuclear weapons in Belarus. We need a viable European peace order again. And this should be free of nuclear weapons and the treaty of prohibition of nuclear weapons shows the way, I think. Europe, the old continent is now at the crossroads between division, decline and economic and political importance or peaceful renewal. And a return to our true values based on the human humanism of dialogue, cooperation and reconciliation of interests. The military militarization on one sided enforcement of interests according to the right of the strongest must be stopped. So it is in the Ukrainian, European and Russian interest to end the fighting in Ukraine immediately with a ceasefire and to stop the destruction of lives, the environment, environment and the cultural asset, the material and resources and social security. We need a new conference of security and cooperation in Europe so the USCE is also very important because it includes Russia. And we need the European emancipation to act in our own best interests as a real force for peace by introducing and implementing effective peace initiatives. There's a good negotiation proposal also by uh, four German thinkers, um, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Funke, former General Kuyat, and Dr. Telchik. Of course, there are the Chinese, the Brazilian, and so on, peace plans. There are great diplomats which have been involved already in the far-reaching no negotiations in March, April, 2022. There's Pope Francis with his unwavering efforts for peace. And we have this format, this Bratislava city of peace. Now, the question is, how can we bring it all together? Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Das war für uns ganz interessant auch. Unless uh, someone wants to add something, I would like to sum up a few things. All of the points that have been made here for this symposium were a approved or complemented by many of our colleagues. And with your permission, I would like to take it upon myself and the Council of the Vienna Club, the first place, prepare according to this plan, what we presented as for Europe, our ideas and proposals
I hope that we are all like-minded in, in this. As for the second uh, panel on the great uh, Middle East, I would be a little bit more cautious on that one and maybe just use one sentence to, to sum things up. However, what is much more important for all of us is to continue this effort that we all started. And as for forms of discontinuation, I've already alluded to them. On the one hand, we have the ability to reach an agreement with the government of Slovakia, thank God. After the uh, 30th of September of last year, Slovakia has the leadership with whom you could cooperate. Until then, uh, they had their own uh, share of Pashinyans, and that was a catastrophe. The Armenians will say there is only one Pashinyan in the world. Okay, there were micro Pashinyans here. So let me uh, try to use my connections, uh, connections of uh, Mr. Prime Minister and others to reach an agreement with the leadership so that we could work together with them. Ahead of September, to develop yet another important symposium that could include uh, participation of uh, Peter Pellegrini and invite to this uh, symposium, and I would take it upon myself to arrange for that. I could even arrange for a visit by perhaps uh, President Vladimir Putin. Uh, of course, this will not be possible without uh, Prime Minister Fitzer and others. And to invite others like uh, Orban, you just need to make a phone call. And the same goes for Vucic and many others. But it's very important to invite someone from the West. We'll see how that goes. The UK will have uh, a new Prime Minister, a Labour Party representative, and I have brotherly relations with the uh, Labour. I, I don't know what they're going to be saying. Very few things will change in the UK, unfortunately. That's a fact, and uh, there are still hopes that something will come out of this. And uh, the second point is uh, what Mr. Rar has come up with. This trouble for me. Let's invite Trump, he said. Okay, we'll see. And these partners of mine, after, oh, and I know, prior, prior to the elections. And my partners, as Chernogorsky and Rar, they are really very serious in the Vienna Club. They give me assignments, and I'm supposed to obey and act upon those instructions. Chernogorsky is, uh, he, he is full of imagination, and he, and he says to me, okay, I have thought of this, I cannot do this, but you can. And he would give me an, a painful idea, and RAR is something that, uh, uh, is a person that gives me instructions over telephone with those ideas, but it would be great if we could pull this off, if we could invite here all normal understanding politicians who understand the seriousness of the situation. And by September, definitely, their number is going to increase. That all depends on the successful um, activities in the on the battlefields in the, the special military operation. Or uh, we could invite uh, Trump here for just one day. That will be really ecstatic. And uh, uh, there was a meeting with Bush here, after all, at one point. It was a good one. Yes. Bush didn't quite understand where he came. He said that I, I'm good. It's good that I'm here for the first time in Slovenia. That's what he said. And for the Americans, Slovenia and Slovakia is probably the same thing. That shows the level of intelligence that they have sometimes. Sometimes they don't have enough of it. Well, in any case, I, I'm thinking about that. And I'm looking at the press over there, the liberal press, really um, estimated highly the, the work we've done. Let's see what they are going to write about our deliberations. And we even have TV representatives here, and they've been attacked as well. They did this, they devoted the whole day. Uh, a direct broadcast. 
Oh, so what? That means that your work was really uh, praised. Uh, thank you very much for doing your job. I'm not joking. Indeed, I'm serious. So I suggest that we uh, draw to a close of our meeting. I would like to thank all of you, all of you who came to us in person. I'm uh, really thankful to all of you who are still um, with us online. They are still following our discussions. They are our great friends. And I think this symposium reached even greater results than the first one. And Mr. Oleg Ivanov is uh, there with us. Thank you. And hello. Since the interpreters are providing an interpreters, uh, Karine is uh, asking me to thank the interpreters for their very uh, doubtful work. Why am I saying doubtful? I'm joking. And the, the last time there was a lot of uh, dissonance between me and Jonathan Steele, because Jonathan said the last time, as the Ukrainian press writes something, and the interpreters did this weekly, very weekly, we didn't hear that sentence. And then everything he said, I thought it was, it was his own words. He was representing the Guardian. And I had known him for 30 years. He's the most objective chief of uh, the Guardian. And then he said those things. And that sentence was, as the Ukrainian press writes, media writes, we didn't hear that. Thank you. It was a great honor for me to have such great guests. And uh, uh, Mr. Dadon was here, and he had uh, a, an audience in the parliament. Mr. Dodik um, from Republika Srpska is going to be here as well. So I wanted to thank you, my dear friend, Jan, and, and you, our colleagues from the Brotherly Azerbaijan, Brotherly for you, not, not for me, but still. And thank you to all. And until we see each other again. But there is one a more important event uh, that's left for us today. We we'll all go now to see how Slovakia is going to destroy Ukraine in football on the soccer field. And we'll see how that happens. Thank you and goodbye.